Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garment and cast lot. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. You see, the first thing that we should do to make sure that our conscience is clear as we move forward in life, even as Mount Zion, as we say we are moving forward, the first thing that we want to do is to forgive. Amen? Because to find out what that means, Luke, you know, is going to show us what forgiveness is all about and how that relates to what happened on the cross at Calvary. Because the first thing that Jesus said when he was at the cross at Calvary, if we know anything about Jesus Christ or God or the message of the Bible, you wouldn't be surprised at all because in this say we find two things. Number one is our greatest problem. And what is our greatest problem? It's unforgiveness. And the second thing that we find in this text is our greatest need. And what is our greatest need? It's forgiveness. So Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing in the NIV. And they divided his clothes by casting lots. You see, while the world thought they were doing the worst to Jesus, Jesus was doing his best for the world. And this is for you and I today. Amen? If you are not right with someone who has wronged you, if you are not forgiving someone who has failed you, if you are bitter towards someone who has blasted you, in a simple statement, Jesus tells us how we can make our own conscience clear. There are three things that we must do in our relationship with others to make sure that we are not only living right, but we are right with God. Amen? And number one is to focus on God. Number two is to be full of forgiveness. And the last one is to be free from bitterness. Okay, I'll be able to do one of them tonight, you know, because of limited time. But let's just talk about focusing on God, because that is so important. Because the greatest injustice that we've ever done in the history of mankind that was so unjust, there's no other justice that only compared to this one. It's when the perfect, holy son of God being crucified on the cross for crimes and sins of others, your sins. He had to pay that price in a very, 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 you know, um, inhumane way of killing somebody. And what do you expect? You expect Jesus Christ to have fixed, you know, his eyes like laser on those who spat on him, those who beat him, those who mocked him, those who nailed him on the cross as he died in agony. But his focus was on the Father. His focus was on God. So listen to the first word that came out of the mouth of Jesus Christ on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Children of God, every time somebody hurts you, every time somebody pulls the rod from under you, every time somebody takes a shot at you, every time somebody wants to undermine you, bite you, say horrible things about you, trying to crush you, to bring you to that place where you'll be devastated, all you have to do is to focus on God. Because what the devil wants you to do is to focus on the things that have been said about you. Is to focus on the people who are saying those things about you. And of course, when you focus on that, what you want is looking for punishment. Children of God, no matter what you do, they might say things about you. Focus on God, not on what they are saying, on what they are doing. Jesus did not focus on the people who nailed him on the cross. He did not focus on the people he was dying for on that cross. He focused on God. Mount Zion, do not focus on what people are saying about you. That's the tactics of the enemy. That's from the devil himself. So that you will lose direction. You, 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 you start you start sidetracking. You know? And that's why I don't listen. I don't I don't listen to you. Alright? I've made up my mind what I'm going to do is to serve God. Alright? What you say about James Mara, what you don't say about James Mara, what you want to do in Mount Zion, what you don't want to do in Mount Zion, and I'm in the church, that's your problem. That is not my problem. You have to answer to God. Amen? So focus on God. 
Are you hearing me, Mount Zion? Focus on God. Amen? Because when we focus on God, there is nothing that the devil has on you. So the example that Jesus has set for you and wants you to replicate is that very hard. Every heartache is a sign that God wants you to turn your focus on Him. Okay? So when somebody criticizes you, when somebody says something about you, God wants you to focus on who? On him and not on that person. So in replicating Jesus Christ, we don't look for sympathy because there was no sympathy for Jesus Christ, right? Do you know that this is the only time that Jesus ever asked his father to forgive somebody? He never did. On other occasions, Jesus Christ will forgive sinners himself. But here, he asked the father to forgive them. Why did he do that? Why did he ask the father? You remember in the book of Luke 27, 32, when uh, the paralytic man was taken off the roof, and Jesus Christ, you know, his friends lowered him down, and Jesus prayed for him. What did he say? He said, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees got mad, complained. They said, only God can forgive. And they were absolutely right. Only God can forgive. But Jesus Christ was God. They didn't know. So they were right. Okay. But Jesus asked the Father to forgive them. Why? Because Jesus was dying on the cross and God cannot die. Alright? And why was he dying on that cross? He was dying for you and I. He bore our sins. So he was dying. And he still was the only one who could forgive to forgive those who were hurting him. And that's why he has his father to forgive them. Alright? I mean, this was so amazing. Because um, uh, Peter was there. It was so amazing that even Peter wrote about this in the book of Second uh, First Peter 2.23. This is what Peter said. He said, when they hold their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threat. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Alright, so even Peter took note of that. He entrusted himself to God. If you can entrust, if you can trust God with your heart, if you can trust God with your heart, the pain that you are going through, if you can trust God who loves you, then you can trust God with the one who hates you. Listen to me carefully, children of God. When other people hurt you and cause you hurt you, All you have to do is to love God. Because what you do not want them to do is to separate you from the love of God. Are you with me? Rather use them as a bridge to bring you closer to God. Okay? Do not allow people to separate you from God. No matter what they say about you, no matter how much they criticize you, use them as a bridge. Alright? That's what you should do. And when the things get tougher, you just turn your eyes to God. And that's what Jesus Christ did. And secondly, we should be full of forgiveness. Jesus is focused on the Father and what the Father does. He says, Father, forgive them. Alright? Okay, let's be honest. If somebody has just pressed a crown of thorn on your head and you're bleeding, alright? They stripped you naked. Brutally you know, punched and beat you senselessly. Drove nails through your hands and your feet. Mocked you, laughed at you, made fun of you. Gambled on your clothes. Not because of what you have done, but because of what they have done. Would you honestly pray that kind of prayer for them, Father, forgive them? Some of you have been honest now, right? Because when you're on the highway and somebody comes in front of you, did he say, Father, forgive that driver for he doesn't know what he's doing? You go, boom, boom, you know, right? <laughs> yeah. And sometimes something people even do the number one sign, okay? I'm not going to do it here, but they'll do the number one sign, <laughs> all right? So, it just goes to show human nature, but that's exactly what Jesus doesn't want us to do. He wants us to learn to forgive, okay? I'm going to do the answer. But remember, Jesus could have called. 12 legions of angels to come and fight for him. 
He could have commanded the angels already. They are ready to fight. He could have just commanded them. And they would have been there to fight for him. But he didn't do that. He just said, Father, forgive them. And that word forgive is always in the, in the, in the present tense. It's actually in the present continuous. Because if you remember in the book of Matthew 18, 22, when Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall I, my brother, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. I don't know why Peter came up with that number. Till seven times. But Jesus turned around and said, I say unto thee, un, until seven times, but until seventy times seven. All right? Yes. So it's a continuous thing to forgive somebody. It's continuous. All right? It's not something that you do. So, you know what? I forgive you. I forgive you yesterday. Today, if you do this, thing, I'm going to deal with you. Okay? It's not like that. You keep forgiving. All right? And so, and, and Jesus, and Jesus actually demonstrated that in himself. All right? When he said that to, to Peter, but he also demonstrated it. Because as those soldiers passed on him, as they beat him up, as they mocked him, he said, Father, forgive them. When they nailed his hands and his feet to that cross, he said, Father, forgive them. When they slammed that cross, while he was on it, on the ground, and they lifted it up, he said, Father, forgive them. For they do not what they are doing. As people walked by, they saw the bleeding naked Jesus, his body. It was totally humiliating. But they were making fun of him. They were jeering at him. They were cursing him. Jesus was absolutely for forgiveness. Right? If anyone had any reason and the right not to forgive anyone, it was Jesus Christ. Because he was the ultimate innocent victim. It, was, it wasn't just that he was innocent of a particular accusation, but he was innocent of any accusation. Alright? He, he, he never wronged anyone. He never said a wrong word, a wrong word to anybody. He was 100% had 100% clean record in God. So he had the right not to forgive, but he could forgive. And here, Jesus, who needed no forgiveness, but forgave those who had no right to be forgiven. So, children of God, I just want to encourage us. Let us learn to forgive. Do not let people be really from the things of God. All right? When they criticize you, when they say something, even if you are passing, they say something, they are going to hurt you. Don't worry about it. Focus on God. And when you focus on God, you become a better person. And we're all followers of Jesus Christ. We're all followers of Jesus Christ. Let us follow what Jesus did. God bless you all. to go to the second word of Jesus on the cross. Verse 39, one of the criminals who hung there of insult at Jesus. Are you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Amen. You know, Jesus did not receive mockery from only the Roman soldiers. Amen. He received mockery also from a criminal. 
That's how he humiliated the world. But thank God for the man of God. He said, that forgiveness is so important. Amen. One thing I want us to learn from that is all the, all these things that were taking place. The two criminals, one on the left and one on the right. I want to say, you say you are Messiah. You say you are the Son of God. What can you save yourself and save us? You know, that's what people do. Thank God what Pastor Money will say. Don't listen to what people say. And you know, for people to mock you, it's annoying. People make fun out of you. People mock at you. And, and, and most of the time, we the Christian we receive mockery. Oh, that the God people, oh, the pastor, oh, you this. Mockery. It's a no. But how do we respond? As a child of God, if they are mocking at you, how do you respond? What do you say to them? Do you let them go? Do you mock them back? You send it back to them. One of the criminals, criminals on the cross, mocking the Son of God. Criminal on the cross. Do you receive mockery for you? Jesus, he did nothing. But he received more grace. You can go to the next verse. Let's see. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? He said. Since you are honored the same sentence, you don't fear God. Is the beginning of wisdom. Hallelujah. How many of us have a fear of God in us? We don't fear God. Sometimes we even fear our fellow men than God. Amen. Some of us, when our boss is coming, we're running. Amen. Church with dread. The fear of the Lord. He asked, the other criminal asked him, You don't fear God, you see that. Verse 41. We are punished justly, but we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Hallelujah. Jesus did nothing wrong. But he suffered for you and myself. He bore our iniquities. He did nothing wrong. As the man of God was saying, he had the power to command legion from heaven to destroy everyone. Because of you and myself, he accepted the disgrace. He was beaten. His body was broken. He bled. That's why sometimes I don't really like to watch the movie. Every time I watch it, I cry. Told him, I 
Jerusalem, we are justly being punished. This thing we did, that's what we paid for. But this man did nothing. But he paid for the sin of you and myself. And you have no fear in you. You talk back to him. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. I love what the criminal was just saying that. What did you? I was so close. Then he said, Jesus, remember me. Oh, hallelujah. When you come into your Sometimes say the words in our prayer. In our personal prayer, when you near say, Jesus, remember me. As a master, say, You have no fear for God, please just remember me. I'm a sinner, I'm a criminal. It's true, I'm on this cross for what I did. Just remember me when you get to your kingdom. Hallelujah. Then he said, Jesus, remember me. Oh, glory to God. What a beautiful day. And finally, verse 43. Then Jesus answered. That brings us to the second. you today and me right now when Jesus speaks no devil can say anything when he said yes it's yes when he said no it's no tell somebody say when Jesus said yes no man can say no hallelujah when he speaks, the devil can stand. And because this criminal that was on the other side realized, I said, Master, remember me. Jesus, remember him. Hallelujah. How many times you and myself can realize our wrong? And turn to the master and say, forgive me. Every time all we do, we justify ourselves. Oh, I didn't do it. Sometimes we lie. No, amen. You know you did it. Instead of bowing down before Jesus and say, I'm sorry, master. But we, we, because we can talk, we can speak English, we, we, we're good at talking. You know, so, somebody said the lawyer will not go to heaven. <laughs> Amen. They try to bend it in just to be in the field. Amen. Or watching the trial just look. Everybody sing it to the men, me on the men neck. For up to nine minutes. And you try to justify it. No, I don't want to go there. Amen. It's very important, people. The criminal realized. He even rebuked his friend. And say you don't have the fear of God. And then he turned to Jesus. Said, Master, remember me. In other words, I'm a sinner. I'm here for what I did. I'm not here to justify myself. I just want you to remember me when you get to your kingdom. Because of the words. They were sincere. Hallelujah. It were not words that he was just saying because he wanted to say it. He was saying the words from his heart. And Jesus knew it. Amen. 
How many times are we sincere when we are wrong to look into your brother's face and say, brother, I'm sorry. And then turn to Jesus and say, I'm sorry. It's hard, even with a Christian. Amen. We always now want to be wrong. We want to be right. Somebody told me, you know what prolonged our wars in Africa because everybody wants to be right. Let me give you an example. If two people on a single or a pathway want to cross the river together, one from the upper, opposite side, would they make it? No. But the money is coming and I'm going. And that one path. Amen. That's why even husband, whatever, when you're fighting, fighting, fight, somebody got to say you oh, are sorry. Amen. But you justify yourself. Oh, I did hustle. Oh, no, I did white boy. This is your confusion. I'm speaking to somebody tonight. Amen. There must be a compromise at a certain point. But what I'm trying to say, this criminal, he realized he spoke from his heart. And he said, Jesus, remember. And Jesus said, today, not tomorrow, Right now, you will be with me in the paradise. May the Almighty God bless you. All right.
family is important. Mount Zion, family is important. Family is important. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, the man still had courage. Jesus was still strong. Jesus did not end there. He turned to the disciple. What disciple? John. Here is your mother. He presented Mary. John.
your parents, Mamzayo? If your parents are dead and gone, who is that auntie that took care of you? Who is that uncle that helped raise you? Do you think about them? Do you think about them? Your family, love is being taught to you. When you think of your loved ones and you pray for your loved ones, call them. Let them know you love them. I don't believe it's when the dead is in the casket that you say all good things. I will speak good of my husband when he's alive. I want him to hear it when he's alive. Not when he's lying in a casket and he can no longer hear. Be selfless. Remember the cross. Jesus says, John, behold thy mother. Mother, behold yourself. May we remember this. Not only at Christmas time, not only at Thanksgiving, each and every day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Before Jesus Christ could get to this stage of calling on his God, he has already seen all his disciples forsaken him. They deserted him. Even his best friend, Simon Peter, did not only decide him, but even denied it. But the only people that stayed are family. Like the last speaker said, family is very important. The mother of Jesus was there. She couldn't run away. And the disciple that he loved most, which is John, was also in Zafara. So this was an expression of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. And both Gospels, Matthew and, 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 and Mark, related that it was in the night hour. And that night hour was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon in Judea. Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled the majority of prophecy of the suffering servant of the Lord. As we have just read in our scripture reading in Isaiah, 53, 12. They fulfill that prophecy on that day. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide his words with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with his transgressors. For he bore the sins of men and made intercession for the transgressors. And who are the transgressors? very people, we the people. And the first speaker said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The same people, that the day before, they were shouting, uh, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, they were all shouting with palm leaves and everything, but the same people in there, what happened? They all gathered around the same And this is exactly what is happening today in the life of many leaders. That's why they say, on easy lies the head and fears the crown. It's not easy to be a general basia. It's not easy to be a leader of any organization. Because when the, 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 the going gets tough, the people 
people are worse, they will stay. But many will run away. So after the fourth word, Mark related with a horrid sense of finality. And Jesus honored a loud cry and breathed his last. When he struck by the anguished tone of this expression in contrast to the first three words of Jesus Christ. The first three words, Father, forgive them. Son, the coming death period. And Jesus, because if you remember, so it was God in human. In anguish as a human being, not he felt certain, but even his own earthly companions, as we also read in Matthew 26 36. But this has all taken place that the rightness of the prophets might be fulfilled. So at each point of his life, at each point of, of that moment on in, in Calvary, all the prophecies were being fulfilled. So there was no gain saying there was no way we could say that the, 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 the scripture was was um, a day, I mean a, a very dear story. Everything had been proved. And there was no other personality or character in the Bible that fulfilled that prophecy of like Jesus Christ on the first sin. Because Matthew 26, 50 says, uh, but this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples decided him and fled. And Mark 14, 50 said, then everyone decided him and fled. As if he emphasized his loneliness, even as his loved ones took him off from far off. People understand Mary, John, they couldn't come nearer to, to, the, to, to the rugged cross because of the soldiers that were all around and even the Pharisees too, people were mocking him. So they had to stay far off looking at him. And the question I have often been asked is why did Jesus ask if his father had to God for St. Jesus. He had logical answers that even some great evangelists like the Libra have had to give us a reason. He said, the Bible says that he cried out in loud voice, My God, my God, what have you forsaken me? As we read in Mark 15 34, Jesus was engulfed. He was in pain. He was in anguish. So what did he mean by this? Was he suddenly filled with doubt? Wondering if he had misunderstood the mission God had given him. Because if you remember again, we ask ourselves, why did John the Baptist have to go and send his disciples to go and find out from Jesus whether he was the Messiah or not? Because after all, he was the one that baptized him, and he was the one that saw the dove descending upon Jesus. He said, This is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. So, why did John have to go and say somebody get to find out? Have you the Messiah? When he was in prison, in prison by error. So, we are repeating the same thing again. Why did Jesus Christ suddenly feel in doubt, wondering if he had misunderstood the mission of God? Had Or was he filled with despair, concluding he was a failure and all his work was in vain? Don't you also feel that way? When all your supporters decide you, as a leader, don't you feel? Don't you have doubts in yourself? After all, so 
some have said the crowds had turned against him. And seemingly his, his ministry has come to an abrupt end. And that could be true. Because one thing was, when the Pharisees were all arguing about themselves, there was one elderly Pharisee, Gamaliel. He said, let us be very careful. Let us be very careful before we start participating in all these disciples, all these followers of Jesus Christ. He said, because you remember, all the previous people that claimed to be Messiah, they didn't last 20 years, 40 years, they only all perish. But if God is hand, and God's hand is in this, be very careful, otherwise, we are fighting God Himself. But in reality, his words point to something far different. They point to the fact that when Jesus died on the cross, all our sins, without exception, we are transferred to him. All our sins were transferred to him. Meaning, if we say every sin is black color, and every sin transferred to somebody, so you stop stamping on somebody, black, 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 eventually you recover the black. So it's no longer the same color before it was. So they point to the fact that when Jesus died on the cross, all of our sins without deception were transferred to him. He was without sin. He didn't commit any sin, for he was God in human flesh. But as he died, all our sins were placed on him. And he became the final and complete sacrifice for our sin. Complete sacrifice for our sin. What do you mean by that? Because if you remember when we were going through the Old Testament in the Hebrew and all these sins, we read about the yearly sacrifice of bulls and rams for the atonement of our sins by the high priest. And it was something that had to be done regularly, every year, every year, every year, every year. Until finally, the second redemption plan of God came into play and the final sacrifice came and Jesus Christ was the sacrificial lamb but he said the lamb belonged to me I laid down my life I have the right to take it back but I volunteer I laid down my life so that you and I can be saved and it was for once and for all sacrifice with us so we don't need the, 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 the blood of bulls Save us again, he had made our final sacrifice. And in that moment, he was banished from the presence of God because his whole body, the whole flesh, was covered with our sin. So, so he was banished from the presence of God. For sin cannot exist in God's presence. His Christ speaks of his truth. He endured the separation from God that you and I deserve. But the Bible also told us that God sent the angel to minister unto him to comfort him when he was in pain. So this is profound truth. And yet it also should bring us great comfort. Because Christ died for us, we need not to fear death or hell or judgment. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ died for sins once for all. The righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. And God didn't abandon Jesus. Mount Zion, he will not abandon us. So let us make God part of our life today. But it's not this exactly what happened to all of us when we die. We too are all alone at the time of And I'm happy the last two speakers, they spoke about death. One said, when you die, you be on your own. They can cry. They can do everything. But they are not going to follow you to the grave. And the last speaker said, let me speak of my husband and praise him. Why let's make the life? Because I don't want to sing his praises after death. 
because when you are dead, you go be alone. I've seen the surface of humanity, and I realize everything is vanity. No matter how much you love your father, no matter how much you love your child, God forbid we will not bury our child in the name of God. But as pastors, we see a lot of things. We see a lot of things. And even it's so common in Africa, and it's so amusing too, because the Father is so beloved that on that burial day in the church, they start soaking the whole church with tears, with tears, with tears. But funny enough, as soon as that casket is put down, and covered, and they turn back, and this, the, 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 the drummer start beating the drum. They forget that they were they were crying one hour ago. They start jubilating because they are waiting for the jollof rice. And the, the, the poor the poor child will be alone there. So, but does this have to happen? But does this not have to occur if Jesus is to save us? So it is through the cross that the divine plan of God is further to be accomplished. As we read in Ephesians 1, 7 to 10. He said, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the ministry of his will according to his good pleasure, which he proposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. So it is by his death that we are redeemed. As Apostle Paul confirmed in First Timothy 2, 3 to 6. And this is good and pleasing to God, our Savior, who wills everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God. There's also one mediator between God and human race, Christ Jesus himself, human, who gave himself as ransom for all. And also in 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body upon the cross so that free from sin, we might live for righteousness by his wounds you have been healed. lessons I want us to take from this. This particular passage will help us to grow faith. The first lesson is to show us Jesus Christ humanity and his suffering. that he tossed them as we tossed. Then he died as we die. So the reason why we so the reason I think about this picture is important because it reminds me it is okay for us to struggle in life. 
whatever suffering you undergo, Christ suffered. See, even in the garden of Gethsemane, when the queen got to get him tough, when he asked the father, the father is that any way can you take this cup away from me? But he said, all said and done, it's not my will, but yours. So whatever struggle we're undergoing, whatever attack the enemy. So when Christ was going that suffering, who do he turn to? He turned to his father. He called in prayer. Pray. So whatever struggle we're undergoing, whatever thing we're facing, Mount Zion should never stop praying. But prayer is the key. Prayer will win by prayer. Even Christ prayed when he was struggling. He prayed to God. And the Father comfort him. See, it might not be the right, it might be the thing that is hard. You pray, no sin, nothing happen. But there's time for everything. You know, God will answer just like when Christ was struggling. You know, um, I read, and I will say, passage, Psalm 69, verse 28. That's my second point. It's a, it's a fulfillment of prophecy. Christ was tossed. But Psalm 69 verse 21 says, and it says, They put God in my food and gave me vinegar when I tossed. So when Christ said, I'm tossed, what he gave him? Vinegar. So scholars, the Bible, believe that that's a, that's a fulfillment of scripture. So that means that God has already orchestrated it for it to happen. So the same thing to us, if, if you are undergoing some struggle in life, God is really of orchestrating the path for you so that when that time reaches, it on until we will carry it until completion until the day of Jesus Christ and I believe this is important to all of us God that began a good work in me 
He said that Father, I wish this cup would pass over me. But even through death, Jesus was obedient to the Father. And when he said it is finished, and I always say this where your freedom ends, that is where somebody's freedom starts. So when he said when it's finished, that is when our salvation starts. That is the beginning of our salvation. That was the day that our salvation started. He did what he has to do. That we will have those of us who were I said, once the enemies of God, now we have also become, become the sons of God. We are not, we are what? We became, when Adam sinned, we became what? But we became uh, enemies of God. I always say that. That's what the word of God says. If you are not for me, you are against me. So we became enemies. But through Jesus Christ, through his work, now we have become the begotten sons of Christ, of God. Through Christ, the work that he did, we have become the sons and daughters of what? God. So he said, it is finished. And it is finished. That we also he has to finish his work so that we also get salvation and his finished work has brought us closer to God without that finished work we will still be wandering but that work has to be done in our daily lives it's, it's a lesson to us when you start something you finish it because the any unfinished business that you leave you it will come back it will come back to bite you because we know the people of Israel what the instruction that was given to them finish everything they said no we are, this ones are good we're going to leave it he came back to hunt them so anything that you start finish it make sure you finish it for any unfinished business will come to bite you but once you finish it then the finished work will also bring what more freedom to you because if, if the Israelites had finished the work they wouldn't have faced it in the near future so anything that we start let us finish it for the finished work that Jesus did has brought us close to God. That those of us who are far from God now have become the begotten sons and daughters of God. <coughs> it is the will of God that everything that we do in 
this world. We accomplish it. It is His will. Because there's nothing, because Jesus, whatever He did was what? To the will of God. Because the Father sent Him. So any mission that is given to you, be in the church, be at your work, wherever you find yourself, make sure you finish it. Because that speaks volume of you to us unto what? The Lord. Don't leave it like, oh, they gave this to me. Uh, I'm going to leave it for somebody to come and do it. It will come back to bite you because you didn't finish it. Just as Christ finished the work so that we will have salvation, in the same way, we should have the lesson that whatever we do, we should make sure we finish it. And when we finish it, then we will receive the blessing. Because as Jesus finished it, God was what? The Father was pleased with what he did. He said, by the mention of your name, every knee what? shall bow and every tongue shall what? Confess. Because he accomplished it. If he has not accomplished it, that would not have happened. So whatever we take in life, we should make sure we accomplish it. Because we are following what? Christ. Christ came for, with a mission from birth to death. And he, he, he did not take his eye off the mission. His eye was on the mission throughout. Because when he was a little boy and, and he was in uh, in the synagogue, they asked him. He said, "I'm in my father's house." So he knew he knew what he was doing. He had he had a mission, and he did not take his eye off the mission. And at the end, after he died, he said, "Mission accomplished. It is finished. Mission accomplished." In the same way, any mission that we start, we should accomplish it. And when we accomplish, we get a blessing and God stays the glory. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you adoration. Father, he said it is finished. And when he said it is finished, Jesus said it is finished. That is when our salvation started. And Father, we thank you for the salvation that we have received through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Seventh word on the cross. The final word he said. You know when Pastor Lambert I would call me and told me that he wanted me to innovate. And then I accepted part of it. You know the word I thought about? That I thought you were gonna give me? Was the sixth word. <laughs> I don't know why, but it just came true for me. Like I said, oh yeah, I like that part of it. Bless you. Oh God. 
every single word that say Jesus said on the cross, that's something specific to our Christian life. And this is, when I went through, I tried to consider and reconsider. It took me to the creation story. On the seventh. showing us something here. And I just want to take you through it in my own little way. The word tells us, I try to see in Matthew the same scripture, the same text as it is presented. In Matthew 27, 15, it said, Jesus, when he had cried, The scripture is telling us that you see that the death of Christ compared to the physical death that we go through. There's a great, 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 great gap. If I say gap, I'm telling the difference between the two. Yet we die because we have to die physically. Not by our will. Not by our desire. Not as we wish. Scripture told us, because of sin, man had to die. But in the scripture, God is telling us that Jesus willingly, by his own volition, allowed his life to get away. Not just anywhere to anyone, but to the Lord. He gave his spirit life to die. He himself who allow him to come and give it back to himself. Yeah. And that was when he could say, using this redemptive work, the word of uh, the finished work, like the bird said, he was able to say, all he has done has come to a close. trying to be a little solemn with this, you know, because it's talking about the death of Christ, so we're trying to commemorate his death and all that. But I want to transform it into something else. I remember saying that when he said, Jesus said that cry not for me, but for yourself and your children. When he was carried
Christ in you there. His death was never going to be in vain. For some purpose, for some mission, like the man of God said, he should accomplish. But this is what I want to tell you. This is what I, I deduce from this entire story. You know, we do come to a stage in life where we face circumstances, different situations. And we want to use our hymn on the strength to body, to obtain, to redeem whatever we believe belongs to us, what right we have. Like if, I do not want to mention, no, somebody mentioned about a fight between husband and wife. We want you. But you see, God is teaching us a simple lesson here. This is spiritual death we're talking about, right? The physical death is there, fine. But I'm breaking out the spiritual aspect. And I want you to see this. God is telling you that no matter the circumstance, no matter the gravity of the even, I mean, the, the even of all the situation, give it up. Be ready to give it up. We 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 have the tendency of always trying to. Dear Lord, I turn it over. This fight is not my fight. The battle is not my battle. But it is the Lord's battle. In your hands, dear Lord, I commit my situation. Jesus' death was a situation approaching. It was meant for the purpose. Reserve complications, the reserve our mindset, the reserve the Himalayan belief, the Himalayan character, right? The way we normally do things, the way we believe it should be done, which is completely contrary to God's will. It's not by might, it's not by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. It says us that Christ gave his spirit, gave his life up to God. He yielded and he turned it on to Jesus, I mean to the Lord and said, Into your hands, Lord, I commit to it. And he gave up the ghost. Other scriptures say, and he gave his life breath. This reminds me of a scenario. Since I'm the last person you gotta be able to. I know, but you, I know you're going to show it to me. That's why I want to cut it. I want to preempt that. Okay. I had a situation with some friends. And one of them decided to lie. Because the man of God I was working with in the church, that's you see, I tried to share a story with him. He passed some words, you know, about my involvement in the church. That's why somebody see I'm kind of quiet in my corner and try to be. Skeptical. I mean, not skeptical. I try to be a little in the reserve, and people think that I'm thinking something else. But I've been through a lot, right? And they spread a lie, and they brought a bridge into the church, and that was just one statement. I look at the brother, and I thought, you was a soldier. I said, you don't even know me. You're sitting there, you got a thumb on you, so you think you're proud. You can say what you want to say. I said, well, just for you. If I tell you what I do, you won't believe it. That with your own arm that is on you, you don't know if I'm capable of taking it from you and do something with you with it. I said, but you know something? I'm not like you. I'm redeemed by the blood. And so the only thing I got for you, bro,
and turn it over to the Holy Spirit. I leave that situation in God's hand. I turn my right and give it all to God. I'm accused. I accept the accusation. But God will justify me. Do we? Difficult, right? But after two years, just two years, the bird called me and bowed before me. When I met them, bowed me, crying, and apologized that I was forgiven, that I have nothing against you. Because of what the Lord did to him, what he went through, he almost lost his life. And this is what I'm trying to say. And I don't know why Pastor Lambo gave me this question, but I think I understand why. We need to learn to give it up. We need to learn to give it up. Stop fighting. How far can your strength take you? How far can it carry you? How much can you do with your little strength? Without God, we can do nothing. We mean nothing. We stand for nothing. We represent nothing. Without Christ, our entire existence is in vain. But because we have the Redeemer, because we have the Lord, because we have, because we have the Creator of all things, life is a hope for us. Hallelujah. Give it up. And this is what I want us to do. Let's stand up. I know you're going to do all the everything else, but let me do this. We're going to, we're going to pray this prayer. You first of all surrender it to God and say, Father, I have done all that I could within my own strength, and I feel now I'm giving up to you. Hallelujah. Jesus' name. Amen. We bless you, Lord.